My name is Brad Wheeler. I'm the Vice President for IT at Indiana University and one of the Kowali co-founders. And uh, in putting this together, we've just we've made a, uh, a lot of choices over the last eight years. Uh, you know, kind of confronted a problem or an opportunity and said, uh, okay, well, what would make sense economically or how we work together or how we're organized? And so now a lot of that's been compressed and that's kind of how we do things around here. And this is the 101 class to try to catch folks up on what were some of those decisions, what do we do, and you know, how does this work. Now one thing 101 class is not, it is not the sheep dip of the Kuali acronyms. And as you may have noticed walking down the hallway, people walk around talking about, you know, Olay, K, uh, KRAD, you know, all sorts of things as if it's English. If you just kind of look puzzled when they say those things, some of them will catch on, the, oh, I mean the library project. I mean the, yes, the application development tools. So let's head on into this. I'll take some questions as we go, if you want to stop me. And uh, otherwise, we'll take some at the end as well. So what makes this whole thing work? Number one is the license. Software license matters a great deal. Many of us have software that we've received from commercial firms. We're carrying it in our pockets right now of licensed software. License implies rights to do certain things or limitations on what other things you can do. So when we started working with Kowali, we knew we wanted to use open source software license, a very promiscuous software license, if I can be blunt, that uh, this software license says, you can go and run with this stuff and do anything you want. You want to package it and sell it. You want to mix it with your stuff. You want to commercialize. We really believed that a non-restrictive approach to reuse was the best thing in higher ed. And again, that comes from when I publish a paper as a professor, if you think that's a good idea or a good theory and you want to write it in your next paper and do something with it, uh, you ought to make a reference and give me credit. That's good habit. But off you go. Reuse however you want. So the people who are coming together, the institutions uh, to produce software, one of the incentives is we know we will all share our stuff with each other. But you know, the larger world out there really is the software consumers. Now, this is one of the problems, as some would say, in open source. It's like, well, why would I invest in that system when it's going to be freely available at the end? Wouldn't I be shrewd to just sit on the sideline and let Indiana and, you know, Maryland and let those other guys carry the water on this thing, and then I'll just take it at the end? You know, Nature has a certain balance to it. The folks who are software producers, one of the things they've learned, you are essentially buying down your implementation cost because you understand it better. That feature that you needed, that you must have fuchsia colored screens for the research office. If you must have fuchsia screens, then we probably could get that into the design in some way. And so you don't have to work it over down, down the way. So software producers and software consumers both have motivations and that is all consistent with our values. The third piece of this is commercial support. Kowali be began from the beginning to make it as easy as possible for commercial firms to want to work with the community. They don't have to worry that if they spend some of their own money and they write some really clever stuff that is valuable. Maybe it installs the software, it integrates with other things, connects to SunGuard or Banner or whatever. If they wanted to sell that in the marketplace and consult around it, it's okay with us. They can reincorporate some of the Kowali software in doing that. But I want to really drive the point home. A lot of people are surprised to realize how much our commercial affiliates understand the values of the community. Our commercial affiliates are not withholding lots of this stuff. You find them some of the best of contributing back into the code, fixing bugs, even sharing documentation and such. It's really this whole ecosystem that makes it work. So in Kowali, we are a values-driven community and values are important. These are the, what hold communities together. So you saw the paper I referenced this morning, the architecture of community, it's in your packet. Um, I really encourage you to find a moment to read through it. You see communities get in trouble when they don't know what their values are. If they want to say, no, you can't commercialize that, yes, yes, I can. But 
but you know, I put a resource in, but you're trying to veto what I'm doing. We're, we think it's really important to have values. So one of the things that we've done are, we, we talk about some immutables of things that really make the Kuali software work. And I'll point to a slide in a moment about kind of small foundation, a small core, some legal things, and big projects. Because the people who want to implement a library system, they want a library system. They're really not all about the overhead and the other muck. They are focused on solving the problem for library, or for mobile solutions, or for financials. So the foundation just does a few narrow things that we call immutables. You got to have a charter. You've got to use our license. And that way we know we have frictionless remix of code amongst any of the Kuali projects. So we can reuse. We don't have to worry that your little piece of software is a virus that is going to change the terms of my piece of software. So getting that sorted out is really a big thing. We take care of our money. We have audited financials. All projects, all the money goes into separate funds. So for example, the librarians, at first, they were going to go build their own system. They were going to go their own way. They looked at quality and they said, no, we're going to go do our own thing. Then after they worked and thought about it a little bit, they said, you know, you guys have some pretty good ideas. Uh, you come back and you be our banker, you do some of the things that we need to have done, but they have a, a open library environment. The library system has a separate fund. You know, those, those ornery CFO types, they don't get to use the library fund, and likewise the research administration people, you know, they don't get to use the mobility fund. So there's separate funds for projects, and that's important to know in big projects. One other thing you notice Members can be institutions or firms. There are no second-class citizens in Kuali. So you saw this morning Chris Coppola, he's been elected twice, he stood up, he's a member of the foundation board, he is responsible for the Kuali Foundation, even though his day job is with a commercial firm called RSmart. So no, no distinction there. Three things to make, this, uh, make these communities work, and we call that the code itself, you saw in Pat's slides this morning, the coordination and the community. And there I speak just a little bit about licensing. And I just can't say enough how knowing what the license is is very important. Now, if you're new to Kuali, the next thing you'll get to do if you go back and say we want to do this is talk to your tech transfer officer who will say, wait a minute, we're spending money to hire developers or to hire a firm and they're writing software code and then we're giving it away for free to this, this uh, open source foundation. Shouldn't we be commercializing that? Shouldn't we be selling that? You know, go get them a stiff martini and say, sit still till that feeling passes. There is <laughs> nothing here to be commercialized from a single institution or a single contributor. And what you, what, and I've had this conversation many times. The currency of participating in the community pays back more to your institution than the roulette wheel probability of trying to commercialize a little bit of code out there. So licensing, very important. I don't want to belabor that too much. We began this um, in thinking about there were really a couple of models of software production. And you may know of Eric Raymond's famous uh, book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. It is literally the Bible of open source software. And Eric Raymond observed, he said, well, the cathedral model is like Microsoft or Oracle or PeopleSoft or, you know, this is the big planned, big system where there's a hierarchy and there's money and there's a plan and such. And then open source is really the bazaar. It's crazy. People are yelling, offers to buy, offers to sell, coming together, having coffee, you know, paying no attention, then working intensely. And it just looks chaotic. But think how functional the bazaar has been in human history for millennia. This actually works. And so a book came out called The Success of Open Source, where um, the author is going, I'm going blank on the author right now. Uh, he came out and he said, all the, so all the computer science theory said this is what you have to do to deal with complex software. But yet, look, we have Linux, we have Apache, we have all of these pieces of software out there where the bazaar is working. So something was wrong with the theory. And he works to unpack that a little bit. So for us, we really want to be in the middle. Uh, with community source, what we call it is essentially 
uh, we want to be the, uh, the pub that is partway between the cathedral and the bazaar. <laughs> okay, you notice the theme of what makes Kowali work. I'm kind of, you know, re recurring theme here. That our work products are freely available open source. You can make them better in everything about the open source world. But if I'm the guy at IU who is responsible for the student system, and I've got students enrolling starting in March for the uh, fall semester, you know, you telling me, well, you know, we're kind of working on it. The software will be done when it's done. That does not work for me. I need to know when to expect certain things, and I need to understand the reality triangle that I could invest some more resources, or we can trade off some scope of how much has to be done, or we could extend the timeline. So you really put both hands on the steering wheel with Kowali. It's not somebody else making those trade-offs. The projects themselves of their own volition are making those trade-offs. So uh, two quick pieces, and going back to the reality triangle in a moment. This is what you will see in the paper, and I think this is very important for where we're going. So with Kowali, or, or most of our procurement right now is institutions doing solo contracts. We run an RFP, we pick a pretty one, it's all the way down at the end. We have no ownership of that generally, and we often have low ability to influence uh, a commercial firm. That's true across library, or teaching and learning systems and such. What's uh, hot right now is the green one, and that is We'll still go to the marketplace, but we want to have higher influence. Indiana University alone does not have that much influence. Indiana, with a bunch of other institutions, where we aggregate our buy with an aggregated supply. So a lot of the cloud providers out there, you see they're aggregating supply. So let's aggregate buy. That's where Internet 2 is. If you're not tracking what's going on with Net Plus services at Internet 2, skip lunch and go read about it because Net Plus is pulling our demand together, doing amazing things. Now, if we want to own our future, rather than going to the marketplace to buy it, a couple of different models. The pure open source model, uh, we own it, but we often have low influence of when it will be done. Where Koala is, is what we're calling community source, and that is we manage the resources, and we can make our own trade-offs in the reality triangle. If we want the project to be sooner, we just know we have to put more resources in it in some way. Um, now this is a painful thing, but every software project, it doesn't matter if it comes from Blackboard or Workday or us or a homegrown system at your institution, you deal with this. What we argue is in quality with community source, we actually have more control over all three. We still have to take a trade off, but we can influence all three. Now, what makes this thing work? I mean, you, look, you got 835 people running around here. You got roughly about $50 million of pooled investment going on. You got software releases and, and KRAD and RICE and all this other stuff. As a business school management research kind of guy, it's like there's no way this should work. But it's working really well. So we think part of what makes it work is lightweight coordination that we have this, this tension here that says to Indiana or to Missouri or to Utah that if you will put in and put a, a work and participate with some lightweight coordination, you're going to get more value out of the community. You know, our trustees and maybe yours, trustees come from the business world and they get pretty excited about outsourcing. Let's outsource everything that will hold still. Well, a lot of times there's not that much of a nirvana on the other side of outsourcing. But with our trustees at IU, with the financial system, we did not do a $23 million PeopleSoft implementation. And we are the largest investor in Kowali Financials. And in we've been putting it in piece by piece. We were in no hurry. But in December, we will cut over completely to Kowali Financials. And we will have spent less than $6 million all in. Travel to conferences, my time, the whole thing. And I told our chair of finance and audit trustees, that we essentially outsourced five-sixths of the cost of building our systems to other universities. And we're not schmucks because they outsource to us too. So this is part of what makes it work. Now, there's a lot of roadkill on the highway to collaboration in higher ed. We would all agree with that, right? So the thing we've got here is we have severable walk-away property. 
if this thing were to go very, very badly, any institution for any part of Kuali software, you can walk away with it and go a different direction. Now your reward for doing that is you get to maintain it by yourself. And so there's this tension that calls you into the leverage of working with others and the innovation and the new ideas and this time when you go, darn those people, they frustrate me. But if you want to walk out, you have to carry the weight all by yourself. And that is a healthy tension. And you notice the people who are leading these projects, they care about the success of the project in the community and their backside is on the line back home to make this stuff work. And that is a great tension to make it work. So the foundation and the projects, how does, how does this kind of all come together? Well, the Kuali Foundation is a 501c3, is a legal entity. Uh, we have bylaws, we have elections for uh, officers. All of the officer, or sorry, all of the members of the Kuali Foundation Board serve as private citizens. So I am not the Indiana representative on the Kuali Foundation Board of Directors. I am Brad Wheeler with my home address. And if I quit Indiana University tomorrow, I'm still, and I stayed on that board. So that means Indiana can't, if I had a, a conflict of interest between what's good for the foundation and good for Indiana University, my moral and legal responsibility as a director of the foundation is the benefit of the foundation. So we, did, we made that very intentional in the design. Likewise, in 07, as we had gone from the Kuali financial system to Kuali Coeus and Rice, which is the middleware stuff, if your institution doesn't need one of the applications like finance or library or something, everybody needs Rice. I mean, that's the middleware, it's a workflow, it's identity. So we were thinking at that time as Kuali students was coming on board, it's like, okay, well, this looks like a business, doesn't it? You have a, you know, a top level executives, a board of directors, you have lines of, of business. And then we had the meeting and said, you know, that's just not how we are. Because that would just be an illusion. I mean, the foundation board of directors is not going to tell the library project or tell the mobile, mobility project how to spend their money. That project is about what those investors want to pool together to do. So we threw that out the window and we said, this is what we want to be. Big projects, small set of shared services. And when I say small, that's with a capital S. Small set of shared services. We also let each project figure out what works for it. So there's a, there was a little consternation about that to share some laundry here. So the quality financial system, you know, it zoomed through and its approach was what it was. The research administration, or called Kuali Coeus, was a merger of two projects together. Coeus came out of MIT. It already had, you know, dozens and dozens of institutions that were using it, but it was not open source. It was a closed, gated community. And the members who paid to use that software, they also got help desk support. And so they got some things that we would think of as commercial services bundled in what they did. So when we said, well, you guys should be like KFS, they went, no, we don't want to be like KFS. And we said, why not? And they said, well, we got blah, blah. And so they came up with a model for supporting Kuali Coeus that they would have a couple of tiers of investors. I mean, the software's free, take it if you want, but you really want to be tight in that group, then you pay a certain fee per year for the shared services. They wanted a shared help desk, not to just go only to commercial affiliates. And so what we learned, and we could go on around, but what works for the librarians wasn't necessarily the same as for a research community or et cetera. So you don't get to pick the license, you don't get to pick where the money's handled, there's a few other things, but by and large, what works for your community? Small foundation, big projects. And so here are some of the services that the foundation provides. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff to share, like where do you check the code in? Uh, running wikis for uh, Confluence, for managing bug tracking and punch list and packaging and branding and marketing and things like that. So that's what the foundation does and uh, is provided for to all of the projects. And in a little bit of an eye chart for some strain, with some strain, you see a row of projects across the top. You see some shared services, project boards, functional councils, project management, development teams, subject matter experts. Each project organizes those the way they want. RICE is a shared service to all of the projects. And then the foundation 
Our job is to help make the project succeed. That's really what the foundation's job is to do. And when I said S, you know, we're running this entire enterprise with four staff. And that's because the staff are in the colleges and universities. That's, you guys are the ones who know what you need. And so someone might go, well, wait a minute, I don't want to have my staff doing these things. I'd rather just write a check and hire some commercial firm because I don't want my staff doing these things. Look, I mean, money is money is money. You know, so if you want to pay through writing a check to a commercial firm to take on some responsibilities or things you need, we got a bunch of commercial affiliates. Write them a check. They will cash it. They will like that. If you want to put your staff in with some split time or participating in some way, I was just telling my, my friends up here, I can tell you as a CIO at Indiana University, our engagement with Kuali Communities and uh, earlier days with Sakai have been some of the very best staff professional investments we have ever made. I couldn't even begin to name the number of people who have built their careers and risen up through these responsibilities as we've gone along and just a little bit of lightweight coordination at the foundation. So where do little Kuali projects come from, Mommy? Well, here, let me tell you. Okay. So how, how does this come about? So projects typically go through some stages that there's a common need out there. You know, when we're looking at the National Sciences Foundation or the National Institutes of Health and on the research side, they're saying if you're going to submit a big grant, it has to go through Fastlane or through grants.gov. So we're only going to take electronic submissions, and I don't care what your university uses, but it's got to come into us through this particular format. Well, that's just a common problem that we've all got. Right now, we've all got this common problem called mobile devices. You know, and yes, that actually is a phone, believe it or not. Um, we got students, we got faculty, we got legacy systems of, of PeopleSoft and SunGuard and Homegrown and Library and you know, but where's the buses and GPSs on them. How are we going to get all that information to these mobile devices? We all need a mobile layer in between that stuff we've got and the ever-changing landscape of consumer devices. So when people realize that there's a common need, then we generally start kind of fussing, cussing, discussing, like, okay, you know, who, what, how, you know, could we possibly do this? And you find there's a few institutions that want to do it. So the history KFS is a great example. All of the others have followed a similar approach. That is, uh, on August 30th of 2004, Indiana University, the University of Hawaii, the National Association of College and U University Business Officers, NACUBO, and R Smart put out a vaporware announcement that would have made IBM blush that we were going to build an open source financial system and that was August 30th by March 15th we had rolled up seven million dollars it was six investors and you know the rest of the story the University of California came in with a million dollars following that and off we went so there is this period of kind of figuring out, okay, well, uh, you know, who's going to be in? There was the dating game. Cornell was trying to decide if they were going to be in or not. And it kind of went down to the last moment. And then you say, well, you know, there's, a, there's one chair left and the music is playing and somebody's reaching for the uh, uh, stylist to pick up on the record player. You don't need 100 investors in launching a project. You need enough to manage. And so most of the investors launch with about four to maybe six, seven investors, you get it running, that's enough to figure out what the thing functionally should do. You gotta figure out if you're talking about the same stuff. So I will tell you, from Sakai, we launched that with uh, uh, Michigan and Indiana, MIT and Stanford. We were into the first year of a two-year grant, almost at the end of year one, and I was walking down the street and the MIT guy kinda told me, he said, you know what, we really didn't want to build a learning management system. We really just kind of wanted some middleware tools to stick stuff together. And I'm like, you know, are you kidding me? You know, we all need a real learning management system. And I'm sorry if you want to, you know, mess around with this stuff. But the rest of us want to replace what we've got with the real one. So it's pretty important to understand what's the scope? What's the timeline? Are we talking about the same thing or not? If, you know, if Eric has got hair on fire that he has got to have something to replace an aging platform by a certain date, and I say, oh yeah, Indiana will come in, but you know, we're in no hurry. Let's twiddle around that code a while. We'll see where we get, get it. We're, we're not on the same page. 
And so before you cross that big red line, you need to know if you're on the same page. Then we work on building it. There's usually a governance board of functional people who know what the heck it ought to do, technical people who make it do those things and reuse as much stuff as possible. That was the other thing with the librarians. They realized how much they would not need to build in a new library system if they use Kuali Rice and Kuali Financial. I didn't know libraries had so much financial stuff, but they reused a big chunk of Kuali Financials and then uh, you get it going, and then you can expand it with other investors uh, as it comes along. And then there's some work to sustain it and to integrate it with other projects. That's the path they all take, but this red line is really the important one. So I have people ask me all the time saying, okay, for example, big data. Everybody's heard of big data. If you're a research institution, any grant you submit now, you have to have a data management plan. There are no good software tools out there really for dealing with that. So everyone's mucking around with it in an ad hoc way. Well, should we come together to do that? I say, you know, if the investors want to come together and start a project, we know how to do it, but you know, we're not going to start one until the investors say, yes, we want to do the same thing in similar ways in similar time. Now, this is a little bit of an eye chart here. And uh, all that uh, uh, this says is this is what projects have looked like over time. So you see where it launched. The goal is when the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation put some money in and helped uh, grant it. The reds with the dollar signs are ones that uh, we did those on our own. Higher red, we paid. There was no magic money from the Mellon Foundation uh, to do it. You see the releases, the, the big red numbers, that's the release that mattered. There might have been a first release out, but it wasn't the one you could convert your enterprise to yet. And then you see uh, the release numbers that matter and, and marching on along. So different projects are in different stages of maturity. Now, if you looked up there and you said, gosh, we need HR payroll and we need it faster. What does the reality triangle tell you? You want the time to be shorter and there's a certain set of functions that it needs to do what variable can you change? Resources. resources. Put more resources in. And you say, well, no, 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 I don't want to put money in this. I want to just get it for free when it's done. Well, grab your Kindle and sit by the fire then, because it's going to take a while, you know, before it gets there. So this is how uh, projects work. So how do we coordinate this massive community? And we really just enable the community to connect. So here you are at Kuali Days. I hope you recall this if you, you know, uh, survived 6th Street last night. You are at Kuali Days in, in Austin. <laughs> this is our large public meeting. And we got lots of people coming and just asking questions and kicking the tires. There is no sales force for Kuali. There's no big marketing budget. Um, we are the community. So if people seem um, pretty excited about what they're doing, uh, they are, but this is where you learn. You can't call and have a salesman come visit you because we get requests all the time. Well, can you respond to our dysfunctional RFP process? No. No, no we don't do that. Um, you can impose that on the commercial affiliates if you, if you want. Um, and I am going to be keynoting at the National Association of Purchasing Agents in April about how to buy free in terms of Big systems have cost, but I'm talking about the licensing and the procurement, and it's like we have got to get out of this rat wheel we're on in how we buy and think about community stuff. Uh, our institutions as islands is just really, really a bad idea. Then in the spring, we have the Kuali workshop, and what the workshop is is all of the projects just scheduling to have meetings in the same zip code. So the Rice people are having meetings, and the uh, library people or the student board, they're all just having meetings and we kind of have a couple of big receptions, but it's not, it's the working workshop. It's not really the public workshop where the tire kickers and others would come. That's how we get our stuff done. So why be a member of the Kuali Foundation? Well, ask these 60 institutions. I know you can't read it, but go to the website. You can find it there. There's a bunches of bunches of institutions, small institutions, big ones. We decided to price membership as relative to financial resources. So big places like a Cornell or an IU, we pay the top money. A small institution, maybe like Haverford, you heard from this morning, 
they pay a lower rate. Uh, we're roughly like $5,000 a year for the smallest of institution, $25,000 a year for the largest of institution. That hasn't changed since about 07. It probably should. We need to probably raise that up just a little bit. That rolls up roughly about a million dollars a year. And so you're kind of paying for goodwill, God and country, making it all work. That's not money that goes into the financial system or that goes into the student system. That's what makes everything work. Those shared services, coordination, legal, audit, uh, 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 coordination amongst the institutions. So uh, that is an essential uh, part of making the place work. And I think it's pretty darn cheap, a million bucks a year across that many institutions, not even counting the ones that are not yet members of the foundation. Uh, I do want to speak to our commercial affiliates because this is important for how the place works. Uh, we currently have 10 commercial affiliates. Commercial affiliates pay dues to the foundation, just like uh, colleges and universities. In the design of the, the bylaws for the foundation, there is one seat that is elected by the membership, but it must come from a commercial affiliate. So Chris, as you saw this morning, he has been elected into that seat, and we wanted that, uh, we want the commercial voice to think about how do we make this whole ecosystem work. Now, you could have seven people from commercial firms elected to the foundation board. We, we, we will allow that. Uh, but with us colleges and universities having about 60 votes and the commercial firms having about 10, it must be pretty damn good if seven of them get elected uh, over our own people. Question here. Are those all U.S. firms? These are all U.S. firms. I believe that is true. Uh, HTC Global, uh, uh, they have a, a, an office up at Michigan State, uh, and they also have big operations in India. Yeah. Okay, that is what I've got to share. Oh, we, our, our newest one, eThority, uh, joined recently. And now, what do you really want to know? Because I'll just tell you. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask any questions, particularly some of our newest members, if there's something just not, not quite sure how it works. The story of Coeus rollout at Indiana. Well, I can tell you as a CIO, it's going really, really well because I don't know much about it. <laughs> that is the surest sign of something going well at our organization. Uh, so there are a lot of our research administration office uh, people here. Uh, I will be happy to get you connected. Uh, we got the first wave of it up. We are submitting grants through Kowali Coeus now. The second wave of it goes in, I think, maybe December, uh, pretty soon after that. Uh, we've got human subjects we'll be cutting over pretty quickly. I think we're still human subjects are on the old Coeus. And if someone corrects me, you should believe them instead of me. Others? Mm -hmm. uh, tell a story, or your stories are funny, so feel free to do that. Uh, compare and contrast what people are finding on the maintenance down. Like on Kuali versus the people's or other package. Yeah, um, as a matter of fact here, some of you may have uh, noticed this slide down the way. Um, this is one of the things to think about with uh, how we pay for software over time. Notice that uh, if you talk about the number of faculty, staff, and students you've got and how much you're paying in licensing and support costs, um, what we often find out with some models of software is as you use more, like remember we went into a recession uh, and it's you know proven for decades college enrollment surges when jobs aren't there. It's a natural thing. People go back and get skills. That has cost me twice with Oracle because Indiana has gone up in headcount. I've had to pay more though obviously what are the material costs to Oracle of Indiana having 2,000 more students. None. You could say, well, why didn't you buy more licenses up front? Well, I could have overpaid in the beginning for licenses I didn't need and had passive capital tied up there. So this sort of thing, when you really look at it, this just makes no sense uh, that we find ourselves in a software world that looks like this, or escalations in support costs where often we don't see escalations in value of what we get back. 
I have myself video done. This may be a comment on me, but I have myself videotaped for 30 minutes trying to figure out how to enroll in K-201 in the business school. Um, there is a growing chasm, particularly on the student side, between what students experience at Chase and Amazon and what they experience on our campuses for many of our systems. They're just, it's just growing wider and wider. And I'm dropping, you know, a million bucks a year on maintenance into this stuff. And I, the way we've been dealing with it, when you talk about like what's our cost at Indiana University over some of these things, uh, we are writing uh, uh, add-on systems to atone for some of the sins and gaps of our big systems. So you write one of those little add-on systems that fills a gap, no biggie. You write two, you write three, you write eight, you write 12. Oh, now it's time to upgrade one, two, three. And you find yourself losing the war on these things. Now, on the Kowali side, because the model is different, when you write that add-on stuff, you can get it submitted back into the core code. And then everybody's got access to it. So our friends at Michigan State and the University of California Davis, for example, they needed something called stores. You know, the, the, the purchasing department wanted to represent to the, to the university, here's all the contracts. You want to buy rubber bands? Here's the offer to do it. We've got a contract. You want to buy staples? You want to do this and that? Well, the quality financial system was marching along and its reality triangle was, you know, to the point of being a big circle as far as everything it was trying to do. So uh, Michigan State and Davis funded a separate project by themselves to build this piece of functionality. Then when they got it done, they shared it back into the community and raised all boats. So none of us have to pay for that add-on or write for that support. So that's a little bit of the storyline of how these things go over time. The other thing that I think is very important is the very first thing that I wrote about open source was in 2004. It's probably the best thing I've ever written in the shortest, so it's a real twofer there. That it is the inevitable unbundling of software and support. Right now, if my vendors say that they want to charge more for maintenance, all I can do is hold my you know, breath and turn red. There is no alternative market and the switching costs are very high. If you put in Kuali and let's just say <coughs> uh, Navigator helps you put it in or RSmart helps you put it in or they run it in the cloud. You know, there's all this to do about, you know, software in the cloud. That's premises and, and hosting. We have a number of commercial affiliates who can run it in their data centers. You can rent it from them. And so that's really a non-issue. But let's say you go with this model and then they start jacking you around on support cost and such they cannot take the software away from you. You throw them off campus and you switch to a different support provider. Or you decide you want to pool your use of Kuali with three other institutions in your state because that would make some sense. It's totally your prerogative to do it. So our control over our downstream cost is immensely different than what we've experienced historically. Other questions, yes? Are you still using Oracle's database behind that? Uh, at Indiana, we are. Um, it is, the, the projects are all written to be database agnostic. So some people are putting it up, running it on SQL Server from Microsoft, or putting some things up on MySQL, or whatever variants of MySQL we find in the wild these days. But uh, for the founding institutions, say in KFS or Kowali Coeus, the big institutional investors already had Oracle for a variety of other reasons, and so that was the first one that it was solved for. Hmm? Yeah, but this is about releases and upgrades. So let's say that we implement version 3, and in the meantime, version 4 is being developed and released. Mm -hmm. Is there an upgrade back there? Yep. Kind of That's a brilliant question, and I should be repeating the questions for uh, folks who may watch this later. Uh, the question is, if an institution is using version 3 and implementing it, in the meantime, the Kuali project puts out version 3.1 or version 4 of some big step, is there an upgrade path? We always care a lot about that because it's our pain. I mean, it's our project, it's our institutions who have to deal with that. So we have been very vigilant 
in thinking about the paths of how you move to the next level of things because we, we don't have the option to ignore that and say, oh, tough. Well, it's just saying tough to us. So yeah, very vigilant about version upgrades. Other questions about how this enterprise works or the money or anything? Yes. Well, we find, uh, and IU probably is as good of empirical indicators. I mean, looking at the money, the real number of headcount and, and such, and though some of my colleagues here who've implemented as well uh, could answer that too. I mean, the quality, again, there's your general cost. It doesn't matter how much of it you use or what you do, you know it uh, right, at, right up front. Um, being an information systems professor and seeing the whole ERP wave sold through uh, corporations through the late 90s and into 2000s, many times these systems were sold on the argument they would reduce headcount. You know, we're Procter & Gamble. We don't need to be developing software. You know, we need to be making Pampers and Tide. You know, why, why are we hiring people to write systems to do these things? But I think the, the evidence is pretty clear. And the same when you go into higher ed, late 90s, early 2000s with the ERP waves that were sold through. I used to say that the number of headcount after buying and licensing a large commercial system was the headcount you used to have plus one. But uh, it's not. I think it probably plus 10 or 20, uh, it seems in many cases. For, for IU, just last week, I had a meeting with our folks who work on student. And I said, look, here's what we're paying in maintenance. And here's what the student survey is telling me about the student experience with this software. And it's not polite. Now, if the maintenance alone was all we were spending, you know it's probably not that bad of a deal. But we have written system after system after system to atone for the gaps. And now there's a dozen people in a shop that's not part of my operation who are doing functional requirements and functional specifications and design and integration. And then our IT shop, we have the software developers there who work with them to build that stuff and, and put it together. And what I said to them in a very frank, kind of blood pressure down conversation, I said, guys, we're kind of winning the battles here that we say we need a little thing that's easier, like electronic drop and add for the students, something that works really, really well. We're winning the battles but look, guys, we're losing the war. We're losing the war and where our resources are going at the pace of what the students are telling us. So um, I think the staffing options required to run open source are proving, in my view, at least experience with the large institutions, to be lower than what we have actually demonstrated over a number of years of trying to take off the shelf, deal with its maintenance cycle, and fill in the gaps of the many deficiencies. Others may refute that uh, experience. Another question. We've got a little time, yes? So as a, if an institution is interested in kicking off or in, an implementation of one of the modules, what do you recommend as training for the staff, both technical and functional? So the question is, if an institution's interested in kicking off or going with one of the modules, what's the best approach to training? I think one of the best practices that has emerged and it started at Colorado State was they started, um, as they got ready for their campus implementation, their kickoff, they did a mini Kuali days on campus. And there were, you know, kind of a keynote presentation and it was the uh, functional people and the end users who'd be touching it and, uh, you know, some of the uh, administration there to talk about where they were going and why. And then they had a lot of breakout sessions, just like you've got sessions around here. There would be people who would be talking about, well, how do we cover contracts and grants, and how do we do this, and how do we do that, and have the software set up in a, a you know, sandbox mode so people could sit down and enter transactions and play with it. Uh, the University of Connecticut imitated uh, that. Uh, Cornell used that approach for their kickoff. And we're kind of developing a package of how an institution chooses to kick these things off. And I think getting lots of people understanding what they're doing and then some focused training sessions is proving to be best practice. 
Okay, I think I'm between you and lunch. We'll wrap it up. I'm going to hang around here for a minute. If anybody has some more questions, thank you for coming. Everything to know about Kuali is in the hallways out there.